According to the Australian clinical psychologist Dr. Jen McIntosh, as a body of knowledge, attachment theory was spawned in the 1950s by Dr. John Bowlby, then nurtured and developed significantly by Mary Ainsworth, Mary Main and their colleagues. Recent years have seen a burgeoning of new psychological and neurobiological research into attachment relationships, aiding understanding about the process of attachment formation and its developmental functions through the lifespan. In a special edition of Family Court Review called Attachment Theory, Separation and Divorce, Forging Coherent Understandings for Family Law, Dr. McIntosh brings together multiple conversations with internationally acclaimed attachment theorists and researchers given the task of providing current authoritative accessible knowledge about attachment and of grappling with conundrums and complexities of applying attachment knowledge in family law disputes. The only drawback is that all the experts for this special edition that was conceived and largely co-written by Dr. McIntosh are drawn from what is described as the Bowlby Ainsworth tradition. Dr. John Bowlby believed that there is a critical period for attachment formation. If a separation occurs between mother and infant within the first few years of the child's life, the bond would be irreversibly broken, leading to severe emotional consequences for the infant in later life. He referred to this disruption of the bond with the mother as maternal deprivation. Even towards the end of his career in 1986, when he was asked to describe his citation classic, he chose Maternal Care and Mental Health, published in 1952, because he said it focused attention on the relationship of a young child to the mother as an important determinant of mental health. Given this view of attachment, it is not surprising that according to Dr. McIntosh, a consistent point made by experts in the special edition is that while being a woman is clearly not a prerequisite for being a primary caregiver, Shaw suggests from current neuroscience that dominant mother care of infants is not just sociologically informed. In normal development, the female brain is specifically equipped for the largely non-verbal, affiliative, nutrient aspects of attachment formation with an infant. Dr. McIntosh says there is also clear agreement that Care arrangements in infancy should support the growth and consolidation of the primary relationship and, where possible, at the same time allow the familiarity and growing attachment with the second parent. The term primary parent does not denote being a better parent, but being primary for fundamental aspects of the attachment development. An alternative view is given by Professor Sir Michael Rutter in his seminal work Maternal Deprivation Reassessed from 1972. He states, Investigations have demonstrated the importance of a child's relationship with people other than his mother. Most important of all, there has been repeated findings that many children are not damaged by deprivation. The old issue of critical periods of development and the crucial importance of early years has been reopened and re-examined. The evidence is unequivocal that experiences at all ages have an impact. It may be the first few years do have a special importance for bond formation and social development. The purpose of the Family Law Review Special Edition is to provide meaningful guidelines for attorneys, judges, parents and even mental health professionals who are often poorly equipped to accurately apply developmental knowledge to these decisions. In order to justify post-separation guidelines, the Special Edition refers to the work of Professor Sir Michael Rutter, who the authors describe as a London psychiatrist noted for his discoveries in psychiatry, child development and developmental psychopathology. In particular, they base their own conclusions on five key landmarks in the history of the field of attachment as described by Professor Sir Michael Rutter's own research. Despite some reservations, the authors of the special edition argue that in the interim that increased familiarity with the above measures will assist custody evaluators both in standardising their assessment procedures and their capacity to gain more from the observational data available to them. Such increased standardization and depth of observation should be highly beneficial to the courts. 
but the purpose of the Professor Sir Michael Rutter research is to illustrate how a standardised interpretation of attachment as adopted according to the bowlby ainsworth paradigm in the special edition on attachment theory, separation and divorce, forging coherent understandings for family law, is a useless measure because security is not necessarily an indication of health and well-being in children. Throughout this special edition, and more recently in a set of guidelines for the Australian Association for Infant Mental Health called Infants and Overnight Care, Post-Separation and Divorce, Dr McIntosh focuses squarely on the importance of the questions we ask on behalf of very young children about post-separation living arrangements and protecting the child's sense of comfort and security as the prime and determining elements to which courts must attend in resolving custody disputes. But as Professor Sir Michael Rutter states, it is seriously misleading to view all these patterns through the lens of security insecurity.